My objective in this little talk is to give an introduction to tropical fruits aimed primarily at people who are not widely experienced with tropical fruits and who are expecting to go where they may uh, be able to grow tropical fruits and they want some guidance in the kinds of things to choose. There are, there are many ways to classify tropical fruits. Uh, one of the most useful ways to me for people relatively new to the tropics is, is an ecological classification according to particularly to z different zones of altitude because in the tropics you don't find very much temperature variation within a given altitude zone but if you go from one altitude to another you find great differences differences in temperature and these affect tropical fruit adaptation very much uh, the th I'm, and I'm I'm breaking it into three ecological zones the first one is the lowlands and by by my definition here lowlands are lands that are roughly from sea level up to 750 or even as much as a thousand meters above sea level and if you want to uh, if you want to convert meters to feet uh, multiply meters by 3.28 and that'll give you feet above sea level uh, the second altitudinal zone r lies roughly from the upper limit of the of the lowlands that 750 to a thousand meters up to 2,000 meters above sea level and the highlands which people in the tropics refer to as the Tierra Fria or, or cold lands uh, would be between 2,000 and 3,500 meters and above that you don't find any tropical fruits really of any consequence that you can grow there are grasses and uh, little little highly adapted plants but not tropical fruits and with it when it within and with it when it within each of these zones of course there there's a lot of variation in in things like rainfall even temperature uh, wind soil types and so it's difficult to make absolute generalizations but but these are useful categories in which you can ca uh, classify tropical fruits uh, and the first one I want to talk about is is the lowlands and the lowlands have surely the greatest diversity of species of tropical fruits of, of things that we consider as human food uh, one of them <coughs> is the coconut which shows here uh, which I, a plant which I love very much it, it typifies the tropical lowlands uh, coconuts frequently grow near the sea so much so that people get to saying that they require the salt water of the sea to spe to succeed that's not true uh, these are in, on the island of Tobago and they certainly are thriving but look at these which are growing high and dry on limestone soil at Homestead Florida at the tropical research and education center of the University of Florida and uh, these grow very well without salt. Uh, the, the important thing about coconuts is, is a good supply of water rather than a requirement for salt. Uh, and, and that accounts for their growing nicely by the sea. Anyway, uh, and, and coconuts are, as you know, very widely useful in the tropics and used by a great deal by us in the temperate zones as well. Um, other fruit, and I'm going to move fairly rapidly through a lot of fruits because this is an introduction and we just want to show you what they look like and we're going to give more detail later on in other uh, units of this thing there's a large group of fruits known as the anonas in the anona family uh, the sugar apple a sweet very low acid fruit delicious to many of us uh, grows on a small tree or you might call it a large shrub uh, another one that's re closely related to the sugar apple is the atomoya the atomoya is a hybrid between the sugar apple and the cherimoya. The cherimoya is a fruit of the highlands, and we'll talk about that later on in a different context. Uh, but the, the atomoya grows well in the lowlands, and some people call it the cherimoya of the lowlands. Uh, a very productive fruit. And, and, and that I, I need to make a point here. The, the first group of plants that I'm discussing is, includes fruits that are widely adapted 
that can be grown under a great many soil conditions that you find growing almost everywhere you go in the lowland tropics. And, and they have a wide appeal to, to people's taste. So they are, because of that, the most important tropical fruits of the lowland. Uh, another anona is muricata, the soursop, so-called. People in Spanish call it guanabana. Uh, this is a fruit hanging on the tree, and here is a fruit that is cut. Now, this one usually isn't eaten straight out of hand as much as it is consumed as juice or nectar. Uh, it's sold widely in, in supermarkets in the tropics as uh, soursop nectar. And it is, I can say to you, one of the finest tastes of the tropics. Uh, this anona group is a very useful group of plants, widespread in the lowlands. I want to talk about the bananas, bananas and plantains. There is a, there's a great diversity of types of banana. Look here uh, at a market in Ecuador uh, near Santo Domingo de los Colorados. Uh, all sorts of bananas. There are sweet bananas here. There are plantains, which uh, botanically are difficult to distinguish from bananas, uh, genetically, I should say, but by their use, they are, they are more starchy and they are usually cooked instead of eaten out of hand. Uh, that's the main functional difference between bananas and plantains. Uh, an important thing about bananas and plantains is that they are shade tolerant. And this is an extremely important factor in tropical fruits. In, in, if you are working in forest zones, you will find frequently that bananas are an important source of carbohydrate because they can be grown amongst forest trees where a lot of other carbohydrate sources need full sun to be grown. So this is a big deal with bananas to me. Uh, I've got some, uh, specific, some pictures here of a couple of types. This is the giant Cavendish, which is the most important commercial banana of the world. The, these men are in Bolivia, uh, in a place where bananas grew exceedingly well and made large bunches. <coughs> uh, here are some other giant Cavendish in Honduras uh, in, at one of the large fruit companies. You all know how important bananas are as an item of not only local commerce, but international commerce. Uh, here, here are some plantains. You see the plantains are more curved than many of the bananas and, and more pointed on the ends. And as I said, when these ripen, they are still starchy and not very sweet, and people cook them. I, I like plantains very much, and they are exceedingly important food sources, particularly in Africa, but also in many other parts of the world. Need to talk about avocados. Avocados are not only tropical fruits, some of them are subtropical or even grow a little bit up into the warm temperate zone. Avocados have the widest climatic adaptation of all the tropical fruits. Uh, the one that you're seeing right here uh, with the smooth, shiny skin is a West Indian type of avocado, and Pollock is the name of the variety name. This is an old variety from South Florida, a very large fruit. Some of these get to be three or four pounds. Uh, a delicious fruit to those of us who like West Indian avocados, uh, and, and they are, they are the, the most typical of the tropical lowlands, and they don't tolerate cold or cool conditions. Uh, here's another West Indian named Simmons, also a Florida variety. Uh, I'm using Florida varieties because that's where I live and that's where I work, and that's what I take pictures of. Uh, there's another kind of avocado that's grown in the lowlands, and that is the, a hybrid between the West Indian and the Guatemalan type. These are races of avocado. Uh, and this one is called Booth 8, uh, a variety that originated in Homestead, Florida, uh, a very productive one. And this is Booth 7, uh, also so selected by the same person. Uh, these are two hybrids that grow very well in the lowlands. Uh, we'll talk more about avocados a little later on when we get into other climatic zones. but. Suffice it to say that they are very good food and they are something that is well worth trying to grow wherever you are in the tropics. Now, another fruit that belongs to the myrtle family, it's by far the most important member of that family, is the guava. The guava is an exceedingly useful fruit. It can be used in all sorts of ways as food. Uh, jellies and canned guava shells and, and juice and, and just eating out of hand. And uh, they're, they're just, uh, um, you can use, it's like a, uh, the, the people say you can use almost every part of it. Uh, 
usually people don't eat the seeds, but some people even eat those. I do when I'm eating fresh guavas. I, I don't see any point in wasting them. Uh, guavas are noted for being tough trees that can grow under all sorts of conditions, except dry conditions. They, they've got to have a fair amount of water. So that's an important thing to know about them. I want to talk about citrus fruits because they, some citrus are, are strictly tropical, others are more subtropical. Uh, the two that grow the very best in the tropics, in the lowland tropics, are limes. This is the West Indian lime or Mexican lime, also known in Florida as the key lime, uh, used when it's yellow, usually, although it can be used when it's still green. Uh, an extremely useful little fruit for beverages and for garnishes and for marinating meats of all sorts and fish and chicken. Uh, I could go on forever about limes. Uh, another lime that's extremely useful is the seedless Tahiti or Persian lime, which is grown commercially uh, in a lot of places. So, so is the key lime, for that matter. Uh, and just as useful and, and some people like the seedlessness of this one compared to the West Indian lime, which has seeds. Uh, the other fruit that is citrus that is very well adapted to the lowland tropics is the grapefruit. This is a variety from, that originated in South Texas called Star Ruby. And it's very red, as you can see. Uh, it is extremely desirable on the market these days. Red grapefruits are sweeping the world. Uh, used to be most of them were white. Now, now the red ones are the hot item. Uh, but, but both of these do extremely well in the lowland tropics. Now, although oranges, sweet oranges, are not as well adapted to the lowland tropics, people grow them everywhere. You go to the, to the tropics anywhere you want to at low elevations and you will find sweet oranges. And many times they won't be very pretty. These are in Panama. This is a local one they call Naranja Blanca, the white orange. And it isn't white, but uh, it, it's not very pretty either. But it tastes divine. And so uh, many times the oranges will have good quality in, inside. They just won't have good appearance on the outside. So people don't grow oranges on a vast commercial scale in the lowland tropics. They just grow them for local use. We'll talk more about citrus as we go along. I want to mention also an, another great family uh, that includes the mango. Here's a, a, a great big old mango tree down in Mexico. Uh, that young man is over six feet tall. It'll show you how big that tree is. And there are several trees there. These are trees of the Manila mango uh, growing near Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, Mango is a tree that's adapted to, like the guava, to a great many soils, a great many climates, and it, it'll grow in some pretty dry areas as well as rather wet areas. So uh, mango is a, a very important tree to grow in the tropics to me. Here's the fruit of that manila, a, a rather pretty mango, but not as red as some people like uh, for commercial marketing in the United States. To me, the important thing is how they taste, but uh, some people eat with their eyes more than with their mouth and, and uh, with their taste buds, and so they like mangoes that are red. But I can tell you for sure that these yellow ones are good also. Uh, here's an interesting one from Indonesia, from, uh, from Java, actually. Uh, this one is, is typical of the mangoes of that area. It's not so pretty. It's greenish or greenish yellow when it's ripe on the outside, but the inside is very dark orange. This has a high content of, of uh, carotenoids, pro-vitamin A, uh, a very nutritious mango. Uh, this is an important thing too, obviously. Uh, here's a beautiful mango that originated in Florida uh, called Hayden. This was our first pretty commercial mango in Florida. Uh, originated about 1900 in Coconut Grove, right on the edge of Miami. and uh, it has persisted until this day. It has some problems so that it has become more important in the tropics than here in Florida, but nevertheless, it's still a pretty mango. Uh, and here's another one I like. This one is called Van Dyke. Van Dyke is, a, is becoming in, more important commercially, and these, the Hayden and the Van Dyke are examples of what I was telling you 
about brightly colored mangoes that are very popular in the international market. We're seeing a real boom of mango production in the tropics now, and most of it is oriented toward these red mangoes. Papaya, the papaya plant is a great big herbaceous plant. It's not a woody plant. It's not a true tree. Uh, but it gets pretty big, as you can see here. These are uh, plants of, of one called Sunrise Solo that originated in Hawaii and is right now the most popular papaya variety in the world. Uh, I think I have a picture of the fruit. Yeah, it's got this nice red pulp, uh, a delicious flavor. Uh, papaya is a rapidly growing plant. You can get into the production of papayas pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, they'll come into bearing in, in eight or ten months, usually, maybe up to 12 months, uh, from, from seed. Uh, papaya, many people liken it to a melon, and it has much similarity to a, a honeydew or a cantaloupe in its, in its texture, the texture of the pulp. You can eat it out with a spoon. Most of you know papaya, I'm sure. One of the, one of the really important fruits of the tropical lowlands, and you won't find this growing in the highlands. It doesn't tolerate cool conditions or conditions that are not full sun. Here's another. Uh, there, there's great variation. That The previous papaya you saw weighed about 16 ounces, the fruit. Here are some that are much larger. That's, that's my pocket knife on there. That big one weighed almost 13 pounds. That'll, that'll show you something about the size of papayas that are possible. Many people in the tropics like these big ones the best, although uh, the market up in the temperate zone generally prefers the smaller one. People don't like to have a watermelon-sized papaya sitting in the refrigerator. The, the last one in this group of, of really important tropical fruits that I, have, that I want to mention is the pineapple. And this fruit is a good example of the, the really important variety commercially in the world, which is called smooth cayenne. Uh, you, I think you can see that the leaves there don't have spines on the edges the way some pineapples have, the way most pineapples have, actually. So this one, it's easy to walk through a field of without getting your legs full of spines. It, it, it would not be smart ever to walk through a pineapple field in shorts uh, because you'd tear yourself up if you were in a spiny variety. Anyway, smooth cayenne is a good one, and many people like it better than any. Uh, some of us in Florida like some other varieties. These are young fruits of the red Spanish variety, which is more hardy and, and more tolerant of our rather difficult conditions for pineapple growing in Florida. So red Spanish to us is a good one for home yards, better than smooth cayenne. Another one, which, which is one of my great favorites, is called sugar loaf. And this one is a white fleshed pineapple, so it's not as pretty perhaps as, as the yellow fleshed ones, but it's very sweet. And uh, the only trouble with it commercially is that it's, the fruit isn't shaped like a can, uh, so it's harder to uh, cut this one up for slices and put it into a can. So this isn't a commercially grown pineapple. It's only grown for local fresh market. Now I've got another group of fruits of the lowlands that are important, but not as important as the group we've just talked about. Uh, but, but a lot of them have a, a great deal of potential for the future. One that a lot of people have heard of is the acerola, or Barbados cherry. Uh, this thing is notable primarily for its extraordinarily high content of vitamin C. One fruit of this has more vitamin C than an orange, and the orange is, is many times larger. I'll show you the fruit in a moment. Here's an old uh, tree of this. Actually, it, it, it's probably best categorized as a large shrub. This is growing down in Trinidad, one of, its, uh, one of the areas uh, where it's native. Uh, it's grown, it's native through the West Indies. Uh, it, it's, and here is the fruit, and it's about the size of, a, of, of, of very large sweet cherries. And as I say, one fruit has a tremendous amount of vitamin C, more than a whole orange. Uh, and this thing has been used and recommended for people to plant around their homes so that their little kids have a good supply of vitamin C, which is often limiting in the tropics in the diet. Uh, it, it is used also for commercial products, uh, 
as a natural, as a source of natural vitamin C added to baby foods and other canned foods. Uh, and, and there is quite an interest in the world market in this today. Japan and Germany have become good markets for Barbados cherries. And so their salespeople scour the tropics looking for sources of this fruit. Uh, it's one with considerable commercial possibility. Another fruit which many of us are interested in is the carambola or star fruit. Here's a shot of a whole bunch of fruit together. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. Well, you can already see why it's called a star fruit. When this thing is cut up in cross-section, the sections look like stars. Um, there. Uh, and this is a variety called Golden Star, which originated here at Homestead, Florida. And the carambola has passed in, in the 30 years I've worked here from a curiosity that was only found in a few botanical gardens and collections and a few yards uh, to a plant that's grown in orchards on a reasonably large scale. And it's now becoming known in the markets of the United States and Europe, uh, not only from fruit from Florida, but fruit from Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, the, the commercial production is growing on this fruit. And I think it, that we will see it be a pretty standard item in the fancy fruit sections of supermarkets in the future in the United States. Uh, it's a very interesting and very productive fruit. Here, here's another shot of the stars. They're a very large group of fruits. They're related to the guava, but they're not nearly as important as the guava, which we discussed a little earlier. Um, but these are the, there are two main groups. One of them is the botanically called Eugenias. And, and there are hundreds of species of this, mostly originating in the Amazon drainage of South America. This one that you're seeing here is the Suriname cherry, uh, which is widely used as a hedge in, in South Florida and in, and in many tropical areas. Uh, people like to eat it. It's mainly eaten fresh or used in jellies. So, and it, so it's not a really big commercial deal any place except as a nursery plant to be sold as an ornamental. Uh, but it's extremely productive and it's extremely widely adapted. You'll find this at some higher elevations. It's not only grown in the lowlands, but it's grown up at middle elevations in the tropics. Uh, a, a relative of it uh, is called the pitomba. And this one is an apricot flavored little fruit, uh, which I like very much. And, and it's, it's productive and it's perhaps not as widely adapted as the Suriname cherry, but it's an, an extremely good home garden fruit. That's what most of these Eugenias are. They're not widely marketed in commercial channels, but they're very nice fruits. And a group that is related to the Eugenias is a group in the botanical genus Mercieria. This is called Jabuticaba in southern Brazil. Uh, where it's an extremely popular fruit, and it, and it grows better than it does in South Florida. But, but many of us grow it anyway, even though it's not at, in its optimum conditions here. And it has this curious and interesting habit of, growing its, uh, of bearing its fruit right on the trunk and the main limbs like this. You don't find the fruit on the outside of the tree. It's always on the inside. And some people will miss it because they're not watching the inside of the fruit of the tree. Uh, grows relatively well here and bears extremely well. And this too, like some of the Eugenias, is found up at some higher elevations in cooler climates uh, than the lowlands, uh, which is important. I mean, lots of times, you know, if you live up in a cooler area, you're more limited in what you can grow. And so the Javaticaba has its value in that way. Now, I want to mention the family. This is really a, a fruit in the mulberry family. Would you believe it? Uh, anyway, these, I have two fruits to show you, and they're in the genus Artocarpus, and one of them is the breadfruit. And everybody knows about the breadfruit, and Captain Bly carried it around the world and introduced it into other areas from the South Pacific. It's where it comes from. Here are a couple of very nice varieties from Hawaii. Uh, the breadfruit is generally eaten more uh, as, a, as a vegetable than as a fruit. It's, it's usually ripened, or it, it can be eaten when it's green, or it can be ripened, and, but it's always cooked. It's, it's never eaten just out of hand. Uh, but it's an important food source, particularly to the people of the 
many islands of the South Pacific. And, and it also is well known and, and widely used in other parts of the lowland tropics. Strictly a lowland plant. Never find it in the, in the highlands. Other fruit that's related is the jackfruit. And this one comes from India, Burma, Southeast Asia in general, to clear over to the Philippines. Uh, it has this, what we call a cauliflorous bearing habit like the Java Tikaba. It bears its fruit right on the main trunk and limbs. Uh, sometimes even from roots that are exposed above the ground surface. And uh, it's a, you, you can't get the full benefit from this photo of how large this fruit is, but perhaps you can from the next one. Uh, this was a fruit that weighed, uh, as you can read, 39 pounds and two ounces. And uh, it, it gets to be an enormous fruit. That's about the biggest one I have seen in South Florida, but it is reliably said to reach 70 or 80 pounds in its native range in, in Asia. And, and a, a truly tremendous sized fruit, the largest tree fruit of the world. Uh, some pumpkins get bigger and some watermelons get bigger, but, but no tree fruit gets bigger than this, than the jackfruit. Uh, it has a, it's, it's an interesting thing. It can be eaten green uh, as a vegetable in casseroles and various things, but when it gets ripe, you eat the, the soft and sweet and very aromatic flesh. It's so aromatic that some people are turned off at first by the aroma, but they, they usually get to like it if they eat it very long. Now, uh, I want to mention another family which I like very much, and that is the, the <laughs> botanically the soapberry family. Uh, don't let the name turn you off. Uh, this family includes some very fine fruits, and the one that is getting the most attention in the lowlands of the American tropics right now is the rambutan. And this is related to the lychee and the longan, which don't do well in tropical lowlands. Don't go to lowland areas and try very hard to grow lychees because you'll waste a lot of your life and you won't get enough fruit to amount to anything. But the rambutan does grow well in tropical lowlands. And people call it the hairy lychee. Uh, you can see the projections on the surface of the fruit, which uh, remind one a little bit of hair, perhaps. Uh, the edible part is that translucent uh, inner pulp that surrounds the single seed. And this is a, a very fine fruit, and I expect to see it reaching North American markets more in the future. We, we, we virtually never see it now. But we will. We will. Keep an eye. Another group that includes several species is the, the passion fruit family. Uh, this is the flower of a passion fruit, and you're acquainted with that, I think. Uh, a beautiful flower used as an ornamental, but more importantly, uh, used for its fruit. And, and this one is, uh, these are fruits of the yellow passion fruit. I'm sorry, I don't have one cut open here to show you. The edible part is a little juice sack that's around the, the many seeds that are in an open central cavity of this fruit. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, the yellow passion, well, uh, passion fruit, that's obvious to you. Uh, the yellow passion fruit is the best adapted to the lowland tropics. Uh, it has a very close cousin. It's more than a cousin. It's a, a, a sister, I guess. Uh, the purple passion fruit, it grows better at higher elevations. Uh, we just had an interesting thing here in South Florida. We had a freeze, and we found, as we expected, that the yellow passion fruit was considerably more susceptible to freezing temperatures than the purple. Uh, a, a very important thing to us, but not very important in the tropics fortunately for the people of the tropics. Now, another passion fruit is the giant granadilla. And this one is, is very large, as you can see from the uh, comparison to the ballpoint pen there. Uh, this one has the interesting difference from most passion fruits in that the, the fruit wall is edible as well as the juice sacs inside, the, the cavity, the central cavity. The, so the whole fruit is eaten. The, the fruit wall is, it can be just eaten fresh when it's really ripe, or when it's a little bit greener, uh, like this fruit is, it can be cut up and made into pickles that are kind of like watermelon pickles. Some of you know watermelon pickles. And, and uh, anyway, uh, this, so this one is a, another one, primarily of the lowlands, these two that I've just shown you. Uh, we'll see some others later on when we're talking about other altitude zones. Now, uh, uh, another group in this a bunch of fruits that, that are important and, in, and growing in importance uh, is the sapote family. 
and there are several members of it I want to show you. This one is called star apple, and it has two types of fruit in general. The, these light green ones that we call white varieties, and this one that's purple, and they're in the same species. Uh, there are just white ones and purple ones, and they are very juicy, very sweet, have hardly any acid. Some people like them for that reason. You've got to let them get fully ripe or because they have a latex that is a little bit undesirable to your, in your mouth. But in, if they're fully ripe, they're quite good. Many people from Central America love this fruit dearly, and most people get so they like it. Another one is called the canistel, and this one is also called egg fruit. And if you look at the fruit on the left, and you see the pulp, uh, perhaps you can see the analogy here. It, 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 people compare it to sweetened, hard-boiled egg yolk. It's a little dry to, to the taste, and, uh, it, but it's very sweet. It's very rich in vitamin A precursors, uh, and so it's a, ver it's a quite nutritious fruit. People like to eat it fresh or dry the pulp and, and powder it and put it with milk and make uh, a very nutritious drink out of it, uh, born on a tree, as all of these in this family are that I'm going to show you. This one is called the Mame Sapote here in Florida. It's called Mame in, in some islands in the Caribbean. It's called Sapote in many Central American countries. Um, so we just combined the two names to be sure we didn't confuse it with other things that are called Mame or Sapote. Uh, it's born like this on the tree uh, on older branches, not on young branches. And this is what the fruit looks like inside. It's got this bright red pulp that's exceedingly sweet. Uh, we're, we have a little problem getting North Americans to accept some of these fruits in the sapote family because they find them bland. But after you eat them a while, uh, you get to like them better. This one makes a, a superb milkshake. Uh, I, it's, it's one of my favorite milkshakes. And, and if you get to Miami sometime, be sure and get a Mame milkshake in one of the fruit stands downtown. Uh, you'll, you'll find them without much trouble. The other fruit in this group that I want to mention, we call Sapodilla in South Florida. It has many names through Central America uh, indicating how long it's been grown there. Uh, the Sapodilla is a, an extremely sweet fruit, and in, if I had to make an analogy, I'd say it tastes more like maple syrup than anything else. Uh, I like it very much, and, and many people do. Uh, one problem we have with it is fruit flies uh, that attack it. That, that's a problem with many of our fruits. But uh, this variety, this, this is a variety called Tikal, named after a Mayan ruin in Central America. And uh, it's a very fine sapodilla. Uh, following sti we're still in the lowlands now, remember that. And I've got another group of fruits that are of even lesser importance than the previous one, as far as big-scale commerce is concerned. But remember that many of these are exceedingly important in local areas. You go to some places when the fruit's in season, and you find them everywhere in the market, and you find the seeds all along the sidewalk or in the street. Uh, and, and when you see that, you know that that's supplying something important in the diet of the people in the area at the time that the, that the fruit is ripe. Uh, there's a group of fruits that are in the genus Spondius, and these are related to the mango, and to my mind, they're not as good as the mango, but when there aren't any mangoes, they're an awfully good substitute. And uh, this one is called the uh, Amborella, and it comes from the South Pacific. This is Spondius uh, Cytherea, botanically. Uh, it's, it grows on a large tree, a large tree with weak wood, uh, it has a, a fairly good-sized golden-colored fruit called golden apple in the West Indies, and you can see why. Uh, it, it's the, and the, the main objection people have to this is the fiber that's through the pulp. You see these seeds that are in the lower part of the picture uh, picked up from the ground. The pulp has rotted away, and you can see the fibers that run through the pulp. Now, you can go ahead and eat those, and, and they don't they, uh, they just add some fiber to your diet, and they don't hurt you at all, but they stick in some people's teeth, and they don't like that much. Uh, one that does not have fiber in the pulp is this one that's called red mombin or purple mombin, and it has this interesting habit of 
bearing its fruit on, on uh, branches of the two or three years previous, hardly doesn't ever bear them on the current year's growth of the tree. Uh, people through cent Central America love this fruit a lot. This is an ancient fruit to the Central Americans. It was exceedingly important to the Mayans and other Indian cultures of Central America. There are red ones, and then there's a yellow form of the same thing. This is, so this would be, <laughs> it's kind of anachronism, this would be the yellow purple mambin. But <laughs> anyway, uh, these are quite productive. They'll grow in dry areas. They're used as living fences. They're, they're like willow trees. You can break off branches and stick them in the ground, and they will root in place. And in, in fact, that is the principal way that they are uh, reproduced, because the purple mambin generally does not make viable seeds. It's been cultivated by people so long that we have lost the male plants out of the population, and so you don't get viable seeds. A very interesting story. Uh, you could talk a long time about this fruit. Another fruit that, that is particularly important in South Mexico, in the state of Yucatan especially, uh, is the black sapote. And some of you will recognize right off that that looks like a great big persimmon. Uh, it, it is a persimmon. It's in the same family, and, and it's close related to the persimmon. But it's much different. Let, let me show you. These, are, these fruits are ripe, but uh, I want to show you one cut open. <laughs> and now you see why it's called black sapote. It's uh, sapote uh, coming from uh, the, the native languages of Central America implies a large, soft, sweet fruit. And so many things are called sapotes, and this one is no exception. It is soft and sweet and, and somewhat bland to our North American taste. Uh, but people, Mexicans, put orange juice with it to make an interesting concoction. Uh, it's used in various ways, and uh, some people like it very much. And we even have a little commercial sale of it in South Florida now. So the black sapote is coming along. How far it's going to go, I don't know. Another plant I want to mention is uh, the carissa. Now, this is grown as an ornamental hedge in South Florida. This is uh, one, 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 another name for it is natal plum. It comes from South Africa, from the arid parts of Africa. And, and uh, it makes a very nice hedge, not only because it has pretty white flowers, but because it has these long branch thorns, which you can see here. And, and it, it makes a formidable barrier hedge. But it also has an edible fruit, a very pretty fruit, in fact. And uh, it's a, so some people grow it around here for its fruit and, and use the fruit for pies and jellies and to eat fresh. Uh, it's not very important for its fruit. It's much more important as an ornamental. But it's a nice plant to grow. This is a plant from the bean family, the legume family. Uh, it's called ice cream bean. And there are many species of this through tropical America. And I must say that they, well, they have two important uses. One of them is for the fruit, which is rather widely sold in, in markets uh, and eaten, the, consumed for the, the white pulp that's around the seeds, which is sweet and, and I guess can remind you of ice cream, although it isn't cold. It, uh, the trees are also used as rapidly growing shade for cocoa and coffee. And uh, they have the added advantage that, that being legumes, they fix some nitrogen in the soil so that they uh, help the, the mineral nutrition of the crop uh, amongst which they're being grown. So this is an extremely useful tree. Uh, they're not all shaped like this. There are cylindrical ones and little almost spherical ones and so on. But uh, the ingas are widely consumed in the American tropics. Uh, and in the lowlands, again, we're still in the lowlands, remember that. Uh, another tree that some of us think has considerable possibilities for the future is the jujube. Some people call it jujube. I like to say jujube. This is the Indian jujube. It comes from that part of the world, from India. Uh, an extremely tough tree. It'll grow in wet conditions and dry conditions and good conditions and bad conditions. And it, it's, an, it's an extraordinary tree and very productive. And you can eat the fruit when it's still green, like some of these are, or when it's completely ripe. I prefer the green ones. They're kind of like real nice 
sweet little green apples, crunchy, with a single seed, as you can see there. Uh, I, I just think this tree has tremendous potential in, in places that are too dry for a lot of fruit crops to be grown. I think Haiti would be a good place to exploit this tree, and it does grow there. Uh, more should be done with it. There are very fine varieties that come from Southeast Asia, Thailand in particular, and we should introduce those to this hemisphere. So this is one that I think has a lot of possibility for people who, grow in, uh, who live in some very poor areas for fruit growing. Another one that seems to be of growing importance is called the Mame apple. And here is an enormous old tree growing on the island of Martinique at an old, old sugar plantation. Uh, I, I don't know how old that tree is, but it must be well over 100 years. And uh, let me show you the fruit. Uh, the fruit is called Mame apple or Mame de Santo Domingo. It has various, one of the French names likens it to an apricot. And uh, it has an orange, crunchy, very nice flavored pulp. It doesn't taste like an apricot. Uh, I, I don't know, there's nothing I know that tastes exactly like it. One large seed in the center, a, a very nice fruit. Uh, one that we have difficulty growing up here in the subtropics because it's too cold here. This is an extremely tropical thing and certainly only grows in the lowlands. Uh, a fruit that is widely grown as an ornamental, the, this is Monstera deliciosa, which some people up north call the cut leaf philodendron, widely seen in bank lobbies and, and uh, homes and, and in the tropics as an ornamental outdoors, uh, and a beautiful, beautiful plant as an ornamental has a distinct advantage that it grows very well in, in pretty shady conditions, this, this unusual characteristic for fruit plants that is of value in a lot of places. It has a fruit that looks like this, and it's a very sweet thing. You've got to let it get ripe because it has little crystals in it when it's green that'll really burn your tongue, uh, as do other members of this family, and uh, this is in the aeroid family. But, but many people down here like this quite a bit, and they eat it fresh, and they make jellies out of it. Uh, so the Monstera has a place. We have growers now in Florida who are planting this underneath trees of avocado and mango uh, and using it as a secondary crop uh, to, to good advantage because it grows well in the shade. And another fruit that I like, that I like very much, the tamarind or the Indian tamarind. This comes from India and Africa. Uh, it grows in extremely difficult conditions of low rainfall, rather poor soils, uh, and it's, it's very productive. These are the pods on the tree. Uh, and let me show you the ripe fruit. Here's the edible part, this, this sticky brown pulp around the seeds, and tamarinds Many people just eat them either ripe like this or even green when they're quite nutritious, or they take the pulp and they'll stir it up with water and make one of the most thirst-quenching drinks that you can find. Uh, it's also used in the best Worcestershire sauces, in curry sauces. Uh, my wife uses it in barbecue sauces uh, with all sorts of things to great advantage. Uh, it combines well with a lot of things. So the tamarind is one that certainly should be planted in the tropical lowlands, wherever you might be. Now I want to switch gears and, and move upwards in elevation to the area that has various ways of describing it. I call it middle elevations. Uh, and, and remember that we're talking roughly elevations of around 750 to 1,000 meters above sea level, up to 2,000 meters. You might call this the coffee zone because it, it's the area in, in which coffee is primarily produced. Uh, it's cooler than the lowlands. Uh, it's not always wetter. Sometimes it is. Often it is. In the coffee areas it is. Uh, and it's a, an intermediate zone between the lowlands and the cold highlands. Uh, here's a, zone, a, a shot in Bolivia uh, in an area where coffee is being interplanted with uh, some leguminous trees, uh, like right at the very left, and, and with bananas. Uh, 
here's an, a coffee plantation in, in Guatemala alongside a fence. But just, just to show you about coffee. We're not here to talk about coffee today because we don't use it as a tropical fruit. But coffee, nevertheless, is a very interesting plant, and, and it's very widely grown in the tropics. Uh, and, and you can use coffee as, a, as an indicator. If you run on to coffee, then you can figure that a good many of the crops we're going to talk about in this zone can be grown there. And some of them I'll be, uh, will be repeating that also grow in the lowland. But here, now we talked about anonas in the lowland group. But one that won't grow in the lowlands well at all in the tropics is the cherimoya. And this is a, a cherimoya from, uh, from Peru. Uh, the variety is conchalisa. Uh, and it, the cherimoya, to me, is a, a really, really fine fruit. Uh, we're going to talk about it when we talk about the highlands, too, because this thing grows from middle elevations right, right well up into the highlands. Uh, it's one of the anonas that, that is, well, it's said to be the finest of the Anonas by many, many people. It's in the United States, just for your information, it grows quite well in Southern California, but it doesn't grow well in South Florida. We haven't been able to grow that. We have to grow the Atamoya instead. Bananas, which we discussed in detail uh, in the lowland group, uh, also can be found at these middle elevations, up in the cooler highlands. People grow bananas in a surprising wide altitude range. And, and this is one that we call horse banana in South Florida, which I like extremely well. Uh, it can be eaten fresh as a sweet banana, uh, but it's a little sticky in texture. Uh, it's best cooked, in my opinion, and it can be cooked in all sorts of ways. But you find this in, in places like Central America, up in the, the, the foothills of mountains and and right up in the coffee zone, and, and it, it's, an, it's an exceedingly important source of food to a lot of people, to a lot of very poor people. Uh, they can grow this and have a, a supply of food the year around. We talked about avocados in the lowlands. Well, here are some that are better adapted to higher elevations. Uh, this is a variety called McDonald that we grow in South Florida, a pure Guatemalan avocado. Uh, it's it's not, not a very good one. You see how thin the the pulp is and how large the seed is, and it has this interesting characteristic of a, a dull, pebbled, rough skin and, and a very thick skin. It's a woody skin. The, the, uh, when, when the pulp rots away and on fruit lying under a tree, you end up with just shells of this woody outer skin of the Guatemalan type avocado. Delicious avocados, very rich. And here now, is, is a hybrid, a Guatemalan West Indian hybrid. These, these can be grown up into the middle elevations very well in the tropics. This is a variety called Hall uh, that comes from Florida and grows very well in the tropics. Uh, here is a different kind of hybrid. This one now, we're getting into a totally different racial group of avocados. This is a Guatemalan Mexican hybrid. The Mexicans are the most cold hardy and the Guatemalans are intermediate and as we said, the West Indians are the least cold hardy. This is the variety Fuerte that originated in Mexico and used to be the most important avocado of California and of many other countries as well. But this one, this is called Hass, and it's primarily of Guatemalan origin, but it, it's classified as a Guatemalan-Mexican hybrid, and the Hass is now far and away the most important avocado of the world. It's a very small avocado. It's black when it's ripe. Uh, you'll find that in your supermarkets almost any time of the year now. Uh, Hass is an exceedingly good avocado when it's grown in the right climatic conditions. So these are the kinds of avocados you find at middle elevations in the tropics. The guava, which we discussed in the lowlands, uh, can be grown in cooler areas in the tropics as well. And if you'll notice here, these, these bushes are growing up at a fair elevation. I don't remember exactly what, but they're, they, they're more compact and they're not as, uh, as robust growing in the, in the cooler areas. You'd expect that uh, as they are in the lowlands, but they still are very productive uh, at middle elevations in the tropics. So guava is one that has a pretty considerable altitude range of adaptation. Citrus, 
We must talk about citrus because these are some of the most popular fruits of the world, as you know. Oranges, sweet oranges, this is Valencia here. Notice the elongate shape of it, char characteristic of Valencia. Uh, they get superb quality in, in middle elevations in the tropics. Uh, if you go too high, then you don't get good quality. But if you go too low, you don't get good quality either. You don't get good color. So uh, the, the Valencia is, is the best orange for the tropics, though there are many other varieties. It's the best orange of the world, probably. And also in these areas are grown tangerines. This is the Dancy tangerine. It's not really the best one for the tropics, but it grows well enough, and the people like it a lot. And, and people in the tropics like tangerines a great deal. You, you go in, in the highlands to, to fruit markets, and you'll almost always find citrus in season. And here's an interesting one that I like. This thing comes from Jamaica, where it grows well in the Blue Mountains, which are not very high mountains. And uh, they call this Ortonique. And they call it that because they reckon that it's a naturally occurring hybrid of the orange and the tangerine. And so the name means, uh, comes from orange and tangerine, and, they, and, it, and the, the end of it is because it's unique. And uh, so they took those three words and made the name Ortonique. And it has, to me, superb internal color. This is one of the prettiest citrus fruits that I know for internal color. And it has a very sweet and good flavor. So Ortonique is one that if I were in the, the coffee zone of the tropics, I would certainly try to grow. It doesn't grow as well in the lowlands. It doesn't grow too well here in South Florida. The quality is OK, but the, the fibrous part of the fruit is, is very tough here. The rag, as we call it, is, is tough under our conditions. Now, we talked about the papaya in the lowlands. And we can't grow the papaya in the highlands in the tropics. But there is a relative of papaya which grows very well from middle elevations right up into some fairly high elevations. And this is called the babaco. And this originated in Ecuador and now has been spread around in, in cool areas around the world. It's being grown commercially in New Zealand. It's being grown some in California, though not on a big commercial scale. Uh, the babaco, I have to confess to you, to my taste, is not as good as the papaya, though some people will argue that. But in, if you're up in the highlands and you can't grow papayas, why then the babaco, you know, is, is pretty good. Uh, a very interesting fruit. Uh, it's usually seedless, by the way. It's thought to be of hybrid origin. And it doesn't make seed ordinarily. So they've got to grow it from cuttings, which these are. And you can see how precocious they are. They start bearing right down by the ground. And the fruit will hang on the ground. Uh, they prefer for it not to hang on the ground because it gets uh, diseases and so on. We talked about the rambutan. Uh, and I mentioned the lychee and longan. And I want to talk about those because they can be grown in the tropics not as well perhaps as in some subtropical areas, but boy, they can certainly be grown. And if you have ever eaten lychees, I think you would agree with me that it's one of the world's fine fruits. Here's a big old tree in South Florida that had well over 1,500 pounds of fruit on it in the year that we took this picture. Uh, this was a 70 or 80 year old tree. Uh, you can see it gets to be a good sized tree. It's preferable not to let them get so big. It's be better to prune the trees to, to limit their size, because it's a terribly hard thing to harvest a tree this big. Uh, here, here's some fruit. This is the Brewster variety of lychee. Uh, not one of the finest varieties of the world, but one that does reasonably well in South Florida. And I mentioned also the longan, which is related to lychee, uh, a fruit of Southeast Asia, as the lychee is. Uh, <coughs> the longan differs from the lychee in that it, it's, uh, it, it has a tan-colored fruit rather than a red or bright yellow fruit. Uh, some people don't think it's as pretty as lychee, but lots and lots of orientals will tell you that it's just as good. The edible part, as with the rambutan and lychee, is this translucent uh, pulp called an arrow around the single seed. Uh, here are, this, is, this is how longans look, and uh, some people like these very, very much. I'm, I'm one of them. I like longans just about as well as lychees. Now, 
it took me a while, but uh, I've, I've worked at it. And I have the advantage that I get to eat them every year. I mentioned the Jawatikaba in the lowlands, and you can grow this right up into the middle uh, elevations as well. And, and Jawatikaba, as I told you, we were talking about the, how the fruit's grown on the trunk, uh, born on the trunk. This is something that I certainly would recommend for areas like the coffee areas. And we talked also about the passion fruit and said that the yellow passion fruit and the giant granadilla grow best in the lowlands. Well, now, this is the purple passion fruit. Uh, this is a vine, and you can see how productive the vine can be if there's good pollination. It takes bees to do really good pollination, uh, and the purple passion fruit is, is more self-compatible than the yellow passion fruit, so you don't have to be so particular about growing different varieties together. But the purple one, uh, here, here's a fruit alongside of a yellow one. Uh, this one isn't as purple as some of them are. Some of them are very dark purple, and here you can see the edible stuff there that's in those little sacks around the seeds. Now, some people, including me nowadays, eat, eat them seeds and all, and just crunch up the seeds. Some people don't like to do that, but I notice that people that grow up where passion fruits are, are native almost always do. And think about it, you get a lot of added nutrition from eating the seeds that you don't get just from eating the juice uh, or drinking the juice, whatever. Anyway, so these passion fruits, and, oh, and I have another one to show you. Uh, this is one called sweet granadilla. Uh, this is Passiflora ligularis, and this grows rather widely in tropical highlands. And, and to me, it's not as good as the regular passion fruits, not quite, because it's not as rich flavored, but once in a while, you run across some that are very fine. Uh, recently in Colombia, I had some that were the best I ever had uh, up in Bogota. And uh, so this thing has good possibilities in the tropics as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the macadamia nut. One of, well, the, I suppose, virtually the most important nut of the tropics, uh, commercially right alongside Brazil nuts and that sort of thing. There aren't very many important nut crops grown in the tropics. Anyway, these are macadamias, and they grow fine in the areas where coffee can be grown, and they don't grow well in the tropical lowlands, and they don't grow at really high elevations. So you've got to be particular when you go looking for a place to grow macadamias in the tropics. Uh, you all know the macadamia nut uh, from television commercials and so on and from eating them. Uh, here's the fruit and the leaves, and uh, there are two species of macadamia, both of which are used for edible nuts, and there are many hybrids now in the world. Uh, a nut that is, seems to be a little difficult to get into commercial production, but certainly something that's worth growing in, in the right areas of the tropics. And here's one I want to mention that is not widely known outside of its native areas, and that's the white sapote. This thing is native to Central America and Mexico, uh, grows in cool climates, uh, tolerates frost very well, even grows down in the lowlands as well. But it's, it grows better at, in, in a little cooler climates. And up here in, in Florida, for example, and in California, it tolerates some considerable freezes. Uh, which is something that's important to us every once in a while. Anyway, this thing has a, a custard-like, white, smooth pulp that some people like very much. I'm, I'm, people who ha are bothered by ulcers tell me this is fine ulcer food because it doesn't irritate your stomach at all, uh, something that hasn't bothered me, fortunately, but uh, it, it's, it's something to think about. Now, <clears throat> I want to move way up into the highlands. And this is a, these are extremely high elevations, you know, ab above, above 2,000 meters and on up to, as I said, around 3,500 meters. Uh, this is in Ecuador, and I chose this one to show you a good example of a, a sweet orange tree growing above its area of good adaptation. See, see that's, a, that's an old sweet orange tree. I don't know what variety. Uh, nobody knew, and it didn't have fruit on it. And it's growing like a shrub. You notice the multiple trunks, and uh, it, it looks cold, doesn't it? And, and, and it doesn't do well. And the, but the most important thing is that the fruit from it is inferior because it never gets enough sugar in it. 
it's, it's always sour. And so for that reason, I just wanted to show you uh, what happens when you get high up at high enough elevation. And this is in an area, you can see the clouds on the mountain there. Uh, it's, this is in an area that doesn't get as much sunshine as many lower elevation areas. And that's frequently true in the highlands. It's often cloudy part of the day at least, sometimes all the time, or at least for extended periods. So this is a problem in the tropical highlands as well. Uh, but there, fortunately for all of us, there are fruits that can be grown in the tropical highlands. And uh, one of them here is the cherimoya. And this is one cut open. The others I showed you earlier weren't cut open. And uh, I, I'm here to say this is a very fine fruit. You cut one of those and get a spoon and go at it. And, uh, and it's, it's really, really fine. Some of you, by the way, just for, for your information, that who, who come from the north may know the pawpaw. Uh, you notice the seeds here of the cherimoya, and you'll see right off that this thing's related to the pawpaw. The pawpaw is the only fruit of this family that grows way up into the north temperate zone. Uh, but, but cherimoya is much, much better than pawpaw. And I say that having eaten a lot of pawpaws in my youth. Uh, about avocados, and here too, is an avocado that'll do well in the highlands. And this, this is a typical avocado of the Mexican race. This one happens to have the name of Mexicola, uh, grows in South Florida, uh, has problems in our wet climate with disease. You see on the tip of that one that I've cut, it's got a, a breakdown from anthracnose disease. You seldom have that trouble in tropical highlands in cooler climates. Another thing I should mention about these Mexican avocados, you notice the, the brownish streaks in the pulp. Those are vascular strands, and, and they're a little firmer than the pulp around them, and some people object to them. They don't hurt anything, and they're quite normal. Uh, but but uh, some people like the, all the pulp to be perfectly smooth, like butter. And so you, people will complain about these Mexican avocados particularly have these vascular strands in them. And you notice the Mexican avocado, all, like the West Indian, has a smooth, shiny skin, and it's very thin. It's paper-like. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't eat the skin of avocados generally, but, uh, but many people in the tropics, particularly in Mexico, will eat them skin and all. It's so thin that there's no trouble chewing it up. You couldn't do that with a Guatemalan avocado at all. Uh, and here, also in the highlands, you can grow babaco. And here's a friend of mine in Ecuador holding a big babaco fruit. Uh, that, that's, that's just about the, the stage at which they pick them. When they've just begun to turn color a little bit from a fairly dark green to, to yellowish, and they pick them and, and ripen them up. You can let them ripen on the plant, but if you're going to carry them a long distance, often over bad roads, you better pick them a little firm like this, and then they'll ripen up just fine. And here's another papaya relative that is only grown in the highlands. This one is called chamburo, and it's much smaller than the papaya. It looks just like a very small papaya, only it's much more acid. It has a delightful aroma and flavor, but it's too acid to eat right out of hand. So people usually use it in making preserves, that kind of thing, or in making juice. You know how people in the tropics uh, are always grinding up fruits and making juice out of them. And uh, that's what people often do with this chamburo. And this is growing right up in the cloud forest. It was so foggy that day I could hardly get a photograph. This was up on top of a mountain in Honduras. Uh, so this thing is, is another one of these things that can be grown quite well in the highlands. And we've already talked about several kinds of passion fruit, and I want to add another one to the group. This is the banana passion fruit, or taxo. And this was taken in Ecuador, where the thing is native. It's also in other countries of the Andes. And you can see the shape of the fruit here. This is immature fruit. Uh, it's very productive in the right kind of situation. And here's a half of one. Uh, I was eating it, and I stopped and put it on the car seat and took a photo of it. And you can see why they call it banana passion fruit. It's about twice that long and, and much longer than it is wide. And to me, it's very tasty. Uh, I like the, the Passiflora edulis, the regular passion fruit, better. But this one is, is quite nice when you don't have the other one, when you're up at a high enough elevation that this is the only thing that's available. And 
I want to add another group of fruits that you can grow in the tropical highlands and, and essentially not anywhere else in the tropics unless you do some very special things to them. And that's the fruits that are in the vast rose family uh, that make up most of our commercial fruits of, of the North Temperate Zone. And I'm talking here about home fruits like apple and pear and quince and stone fruits like peach and nectarine and plum and berries like raspberry and blackberry. <clears throat> here are trees of an apple grown in Ecuador, and I think this is the Israeli variety called Anna, which is one of the, turned out to be one of the fine apple varieties to grow in the tropics. And these have to be grown at pretty high elevations. They require a lot of cool weather exposure up in, up in the North Temperate Zone to grow well, and in the tropics, conditions are different for sure, and you've got to use what we call low chilling apples, but there are some that'll grow. Uh, here are some Golden Delicious that came from a highland area in Colombia. And here are some that came from a cool area in Peru. This was a local uh, seedling that the man named after himself, a, a rather pretty apple. I don't know how well it's done, but I was much impressed by this. So, so you can grow apples in the tropics, and it's, it's good to try because Almost everybody in the world likes apples, and many of these poor tropical countries that are trying to get ahead import apples from places like Washington State, and, and, and they lose a lot of foreign exchange that way. And if they could grow their own, it would be extremely beneficial to them. There are some success stories now in the tropics on the, in that regard. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have pear and quince photos, but they are both grown in the tropics. We were talking about stone fruits. Here are peaches, a tropical peach that came from India. There are various peaches and nectarines and plums that have low chilling as well and that can be grown in the tropical highlands. And often, I must say, they are not of as good of quality as what we grow in the temperate zone. But remember that they haven't been working on them as long either. And, and given enough time and enough resources, they can make very fine ones, I think. Uh, I think I have a photo of a plum, a nice Japanese plum that's growing in a tropical climate. And I mentioned berries as well. Here, a, a raspberry, a true raspberry that comes from the Himalaya Mountains in India. And, and this thing can even be grown at some lower elevations, but it sure does fine in tropical highlands. This is called the Mysore black raspberry. And it's a pretty good raspberry. And uh, here is the Andes blackberry. Rubus glaucus, and they're not as ripe as I would like to see them, but uh, they, these come from the Andes, as the name implies, and, and have a very, very fine blackberry flavor. They, they use them more uh, in, as juice in the tropics than they do in pies the way we do, and, and blackberry juice, if you ever go to the Andes in Ecuador or Colombia or Peru, be sure and get some blackberry juice. They call it mora and it's very, very fine. And I want to mention a couple of other interesting fruits of the highlands that are in the potato family, the solanum family. This one here, growing in a newly cleared stretch of jungle, is the naranjilla. That's spelled N-A-R-A-N-J-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Means little orange, but it isn't an orange, obviously. And these, are, these plants are beautiful plants. They have dark green leaves, that are uh, often purplish on the underside, uh, and they're very hairy. And let me show you the fruit. Here's the fruit. It's hairy, too. And, and it's a good idea to wipe off that stuff because it's prickly, uh, like, kind of like uh, glass wool. Uh, it makes you itch. But inside is this dark pulp, uh, dar uh, this green pulp. I say dark green. It isn't dark green here. Sometimes it's greener than that. And it makes one of the best flavored juices that you will ever find. Uh, people take it in uh, naranjilla pulp and ice and water and sugar, and, and it makes a really fine green colored juice. Uh, this has been marketed commercially in the world. It, it has its ups and downs, mainly a, a highland thing, as I said, and it doesn't do well in hot lowlands at all. And that perhaps limits its commercial adaptation. Another fruit in the same family is called tree tomato. And this thing is from the Andes, 
It has been commercialized to a large scale in, in New Zealand. And people mostly don't eat this out of hand because it's often too acid. But they use it in sauces and things like ketchup and, and uh, chili sauce. And uh, they, they, call it, oh, they call it tamarillo in New Zealand. Uh, but they call it tree tomato elsewhere. And here's some on the tree. And here's one, a close-up of it to show you what it looks like. It looks a lot like a tomato because it's very closely related to the tomato. Uh, but, it, but the flavor is considerably different. Uh, these are some of the things that I have found to be the most common and the most useful fruits of the different uh, altitude zones in the tropics. And I, I hope this gives you a good introduction to some of these things so that when we talk about them in more detail, you'll already know something about them. 